निरंजनम नित्यम अनंत रूपम भक्तानुकंपाधृत विग्रह वै ईशावतारम परमेशमिड्यम तंग राम कृष्ण शिसा नमाम जननी शारदा देवी राम कृष्ण जगद्गु पाद पद्मी तयो श्रुवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुहु नम श्रीयतिराजाय विवेकानंद सूर सच्चिदुखस्वूपाय स्वामीतापहारिणे so today as uh, we have already uh, mentioned in the last class uh, this fourth chapter is something which uh, is comparatively short chapter and we will today uh, have an overview of the entire chapter uh, before we conclude it and proceed to the next chapter so the fourth chapter that what is duty so just to have an overview what is duty the very first line uh, with which that lecture starts is it is necessary in the study of karma yoga to know what duty is so as when we were studying it we had a very preliminary discussion that what duty is that why as a human being we need to have a sense of duty so at the very beginning we try to understand the etymological meaning of the word religion the word religion came from the latin word religare the religare means to bind fast to integrate uh dharma the word dharma also in certain aspects have the very same meaning this dharma is a very very uh Um, pervasive word it has many dimensions of understanding in one of its dimension it means dharayate iti dharma that which holds us binds us integrates us it's almost synonymous to the word religion in this sense so thus primarily we can define duty as an action impelled by the moral obligations which entails to certain extent self sacrifice so why the question of self sacrifice comes into picture while discussing as you may remember we took a very particular example of the forest the rule of the jungle and in the jungle you will find the animals are bound by instinct they need not have any sense of moral obligation they don't have they have been created in such a way the creator has created in them in such a way that the instinct is the thing by which they are bound and that instinct ensures entails the balance in the environment as we were giving the example a lion catches its prey it is it feeds on it and when it is satiated it will never look back at its prey then the scavengers of the forest they were hiding now they come to the picture they will the scavengers the jackals the howls the jackals so they come and they just have their share and that's why they are called the scavengers they clean off whatever is left over by the lion they clean off that's why they are the scavengers so once they are satiated it's not that everything is finished still something is remaining you will find at last the remains of the carcass the remains of that 
prey, uh, which has already started rotting. Now that is being fed by that is fed by the vulture sitting on the branch of the tree. They are also waiting. They know that once the scavengers are satiated, it's their turn. So everyone gets their share, and we find this wonderful balance is maintained in the forest in the nature. But as a human being, we have an innate tendency to hoard. We go to the market, we go to the for shopping, and find that the seasonal fruit is very cheap, and we don't know that whether it is going to uh, continue. The price is going to continue for the next week, so we buy a lot. We purchase the entire crate, and we cannot have it in one go. So whatever. Uh, we feel like having after that the remaining is there in that wonderful machine which we have discovered the refrigerator that electric electric gadget in that we keep it okay let it be there so i can have it in future so this question of holding comes with the human beings and it's good to certain extent because it is because of the holding you can think of sustaining the family sustaining the society the wealth is required that when the drought is there i have this what i have just saved that i can use up but what happens with the human beings we find that this holding becomes an ocd obsessive compulsive disorder what is an what is ocd you go to the doctor that anything which is necessary when you overdo it do without be beyond the purpose that becomes your ocd it becomes compulsion you forgot the necessity so holding becomes an obsession with the human society it is an obsessive compulsive disorder and it is such a disorder you will find what has happened to the 99% of the wealth the world's wealth is with the 1% of the population and that creates turmoil in the society all sorts of disbalances the society becomes carcinogenic like the cancer cells which takes food from the blood it is supposed to just grow this all the cells are supposed to grow in a particular rate to maintain in harmony with the entire body the hands won't start growing faster than the other legs or uh, your uh what you say the, the thoracic region or whatever the entire body it has a particular rate with which it is growing now these cancer cells what they do they become they just start hoarding they just take more food from the blood and they start multiplying beyond the beyond the rate in which they are supposed to so that the harmony is mentioned in the body they just go on multiplying they take food and just go on multiplying and that's what this is almost like the similar behavior of this holding and then at last what happens this carcinogenic cells forms a tumor and at last it results in the death of the person and at last this carcinogenic cells are also going to die with the person they are not going to live and that's what happens with the human society because of the holding it has become carcinogenic with this consumerism culture so we find now the government has to insert in the balance of the society by enforcing certain laws rules taxation so that that what i am not going to do willfully it it is being imposed upon us in the forms of commandments laws and there's a law is a thing now which is helping us to maintain our integrity it binds us it integrates us so now you will find that whenever we hear of religion it is a bundle of do's and don'ts with his and nishedas and sometimes we feel that oh, why to bind us with all those with his and nishedas actually as our instinct is poor in the animal that instinct is designed in such a way that it maintains the balance for us it's not that intellect has taken its place so now we have to use those commandments to bind us otherwise we disintegrate the society disintegrates 
So all those bindings to certain extent until self-sacrifice that I won't hold. I will hold only that much which is necessary. Remaining is there to share with others. So here the question of self-sacrifice comes. So that's why the real definition of duty is the moral obligations, which entails to a certain extent self-sacrifice. So now the question comes that that's the thing which religion was doing for ages, for ages together. And it was quite okay. Why? We were all geographically isolated. As per the geographical location, the culture which has developed, it was quite good to bind that society with particular do's and don'ts, which in no way uh, was something affecting the others because if we are all geographically isolated. But now the things have changed. We find that we cannot avoid it. However, we may try. The world scenario is such that we, that we find there's an intermingling of cultures. And then one thing we have become very much aware of, once physically we are all together, we find that we actually, even as per the do's and don'ts are concerned, which has been uh, dictated by the religion, they, they're so varied. So now the question comes, what's are my duty? Such so X, the religion X says, this is your duty. The religion Y says, this is your duty. And then the, as if we find that that is as if a confrontation between our sense of obligation. So is the duty term, do you have some any universal uh, uh, meaning? So that's what the Swami Vivekananda is next indicating. The term duty, like every other universal abstract term, is impossible clearly to define. We can only get an idea of, its, of it by knowing its practical operations and results. So these practical operations and results, this actually speaks of the universal truth behind all the so-called moral obligations. It's not by the dictum itself. What are the practical operations? How I have to operate it? on it, based on it, and what's the result which accrues. So this practical operation speaks of our choice. In the last, uh, when the class, we, uh, when we were discussing, we just were mentioning that. What's that? The practical operation actually speaks of our choice. That whenever we are supposed to do something, there are various options. We may do it, we may not do it. And even if we do it, we can do it in various ways. In Sanskrit, it is being indicated as kartum, akartum, anyatha kartum. I may do it, I may not do it. Even if I do it, I may do it in a different way. So I have the choice. But where is uh, the absolute truth then? If I can, if I have the choice to do anything in any way, the absolute truth is yes, I have the choice to do a certain thing. But the result that accrues, I have no hand over it. As Sri Ramakrishna, when he was asked, is there anything called absolute truth? Now, in, in those days, in the time of Ramakrishna, when the science, when the young Bengal was coming with a science background and asking Ramakrishna, is there an absolute truth? They had in their mind so many varied opinions. And when the science itself has started saying that the so-called the dictums of religion are all the inventions of the fertile brain of the human being, most probably uh, with some vested interest, they have all been so-called imposed on the human society. They're, they all have some relative uh, applications. They're, they're in absolute, there is no truth as such. Otherwise, how can it be so varied? So when such a question was placed in front of Ramakrishna, a realized soul you will find has an answer and that answer is very simple. It's very profound and very simple. Ramakrishna immediately is asserting, yes, there is something called absolute truth. And what is the absolute truth? He's not speaking of God. The one who is all 24 hours, always in that God intoxication. But when he has to deal with the world, he knows that how to communicate because they cannot relate to his consciousness. So he's coming down to the level of the consciousness of the people and giving a very simple example. 
what he's saying if you eat chili you are bound to have the burning sensation or you may say that what's the absolute truth in it the absolute truth is being explained wonderfully by this sentence that when you are having your meals most probably in a separate plate along with the salad some chili has been kept and now it's your choice that you may opt to have it you may not have it but i will have the chili but i don't like like that burning sensation i won't have that burning sensation is it ever going to happen no so whether i take the chili or not it's my option but once i take it the result that is going to happen is something fixed i have no hand over it and that's what ramakrishna is indicating as the absolute truth in our scriptures in the words of the scriptures they say the absolute reality which is beyond the purview of our perception finds expression as shakti what we perceive with this world ultimately everything can be boiled down to energy even the matter which you see you know there the mod as a student of the modern science you all know that energy and matter is interconvertible even in a small speck of matter huge energy is there behind it is the energy condensed as matter everything can be resolved back to energy that's something we can perceive so the absolute reality which is beyond our perception when comes in the purview of our perceptions finds expression as shakti the absolute reality has been nomenclatured with the word om that om finds expression as rim rim the shakti and that shakti again is not chaotic if it was chaotic creation would have never been possible just think of the atom bomb when the, for the first time the atom bomb that nuclear explosion happened it was uncontrolled fission the and it it just simply destroyed the two cities the, we all know that but when that same nuclear reaction the, this reaction is controlled you control it in a nuclear reactor then that same energy which is destroyed can be used for generating electricity which can be used for in used in a very productive way so if it is an unchaotic it is a chaotic energy creation is never possible so the energy which we find is finding expression in this universe it always finds expression as certain laws it is always within the rhythm the word rhythm in english you will find very interesting if you just try to find the etymology of word that last you will find it is in sanskrit many words just see the english word ma- mother sanskrit mata so similar mata mother pita father swasa sister bhrata brother we can go on giving examples there are in this almost all the words you will find has that sanskrit uh et- etymology at last you can find the root there so here in the word rhythm if you want to find the root it came from the sanskrit word rhythm the word rhythm means the ultimate reality we will find everywhere rhythm is translated as satyam yes it is not the satyam it is not the truth in the absolute sense the truth which is finding the absolute truth which is finding expression in this universe as the law is rhythm om finds expression as rim that rim finds expression as rhythm and this rhythm is something which is the absolute truth which we can perceive how we can perceive just the way the gravitational law is something which is true anywhere there is a wonderful sen- uh, quotation of einstein the most un pers- the, what is it this uh, the, uh, the most uh, unexplainable unapre- fact of the universe is that it can be explained how can we explain because there is a wonderful law i i am not supposed to explain this universe how why because it's such so vast as a human being i'm such a such a small being like an ant crawling on the earth surface how was it possible for me to explain the universe 
that for us it has been possible because the entire universe follows certain laws. The gravitational law is universal. And that's why with accuracy, the NASA scientists can send the satellite on the surface of the Mars. And not only that, there can be land rovers moving on the Mars surface. Why? The gravitation which is true here is true there. And the law which it follows is exactly the same law which follows and through the entire universe. And now I can calculate and I can send a satellite there. So that's the rhythm, the rhythm. But generally we feel that all the so-called laws are just the physical laws. But here the religion asserts, it's not only the physical laws, the moral laws are also the laws which I cannot break. Just the way I cannot transcend, I cannot transgress gravitation. If I say I don't believe in gravitation, I'm not going to fly. That I don't believe in gravitation, I jump out from a multi-story to the top of a multi-story building and I'm not going to fly, I will crash and die. The same thing the scripture asserts, that all the so-called commandments, the do's and don'ts are absolute in that sense. They fall under the rhythm, their satyam. Why? Because there is no, there is, as far the result is concerned, you can be certain there is no choice. I may choose whether I to follow them or not, but as far as the result which they are going to accrue, it is something very fixed. They follow the rhythm. And there we find the need for the duty. In our attempt to break the laws, we will break ourselves otherwise. That's why we find that Swamiji is saying in a very wonderful way, the truth does not pay homage to society, ancient or modern. Society has to pay homage to the truth or die. So thereby Swami Vivekananda is speaking by speaking of practical operations and results. The practical operation speaks of the choice and the result which we accrue as per the choice. And we find that is embedded in our being as conscience. We all have conscience. We may have various options, but there is something, the inner voice which says, don't do that way. The result which you will accrue is going to disintegrate you, is going to harm you. Do it this way. The conscience, the voice, the inner voice is there. So then, now as we find that the dictums outside cannot be the ultimate judge for our duty, the ultimate criteria for duty, now Swamiji next refers to the dictates of conscience. He's gradually bringing the point home that what actually is duty? Can the so-called uh, the do's and don'ts, we can say it's duty. We will find that situations will come when we are in a dilemma. We don't know what to do in spite of all those do's and don'ts. So now Swamiji is saying conscience. But again, this conscience, whether this conscience itself can again define the duty? No, we will find Swami Vivekananda, though he's not using these two words, is actually speaking of two types of conscience. As we'll, in the lecture we found, one is the authoritarian conscience, which is the common conscience for the entire humankind. What is the authoritarian conscience? The conscience which develops because of the authority. A small child is born and whenever it does certain thing, the parents may applaud the child. They'll say, wow, you have done something wonderful. And immediately it registers in the child's mind, this is good. And for certain thing, the child is reprimanded and the child immediately it registers in his mind that this is not good. So what is good? What is bad? This is being decided by the authority. The authority, whatever the parents, the authority is saying him. And this voice is getting internalized gradually. The child grows, go to the school. The teachers also repeat the same thing. Constantly, his, the teacher is applauding for certain thing, or reprimanding for certain thing. And that way we find there's this, this authority is getting internalized and that becomes, gets converted into the conscience. If we try to uh, judge the sense of duty, the judge has to understand duty with that authority and conscience, again, we will find that it, there's, there is a lot of conflicting ideas. So, it is actually the spiritually oriented conscience which, on which 
our sense of duty should be uh, tagged together. We will be tuned together. We will tune our sense of the spiritually oriented conscience. It's not just the authority. If you just best uh, try to understand with the sense of authority, there also you will find varied opinions as for the nations, as for the religions are concerned. So it's actually the spiritually oriented conscience which Swamiji is speaking of as conscience. But what is spiritually oriented conscience? Does it solve the problem? Again, we will find it is almost, uh, what is it is very difficult. First, in the words of Swami, that why authority and conscience uh, cannot ascertain the, say, our duty? Let, it, let us just read the, the word in the words of Swamiji. But what is it that makes an act a duty? If a Christian finds a piece of beef before him and does not eat it to save his own life or will not give it to save the life of another man, he's sure to feel that he has not done his duty. But if a Hindu dares to eat that piece of beef or to give it to another Hindu, he's equally sure to feel that he too has not done his duty. The Hindu's training and education make him feel that way. In the last century, there were a notorious band of robbers in India called thugs. They thought it was their, it's their duty to kill any man. They could take away his money. The larger the number of men they killed, the better they thought they were. Ordinarily, if a man goes out into the street and shoots down another man, he's apt to feel sorry for it, thinking that he has done wrong. But if the very same man, as a soldier in his regiment, kills not one, but 20, he's certain to feel glad and think that he has done his duty remarkably well. Therefore, we see that it is not the thing done that defines a duty. So based on that authority, which has been internalized, when you're doing the duty, there can be varied duties. It cannot really explain that what duty is. So next Swamiji comes to that spirituality oriented conscience. Hence, it is a spiritually, spiritually oriented conscience that can ascertain our this sense of duty as has been spoken of by Swamiji. In the words of Swamiji, any action that makes us go Godward is a good action and is our duty. Any action that makes us go downward is evil and is not our duty. So this entire chapter is actually what is duty to ascertain that. After saying that, again, we will find there is some misunderstanding when we say going Godward. Because the term God is a very quiet, vague term. For most of us, the God we believe is just the tribal God. That I have my God, you have your God, who is superior, let us fight. Whoever wins, his God is superior. That's what the history of religion shows is going on for ages together. So there, just this fight, this hatred, this dissension, this confusion may make us feel we are going Godward. Then is it duty? So however the term God can be quite vague so as to be interpreted variedly leading to confusions or even to dissension, hatred and violence. The question is, can there be an universal definition of God which can be accepted by all? That we have so many ideas of God, but can there be an universal idea where we all agree? You will find Swami Vivekananda has given in some other place a wonderful definition of God. And we can just be uh, assured of the fact, no one can deny that. What's that definition? Very simple definition. Unselfishness is God. Does that any religion with whatever belief of their God they uh, may have, they can say that they believe that the God is extremely selfish? No one, no one can say. Unselfishness is God. The God is unselfish. Swami, in the words of Swami Vivekananda, very nice, that what's the reason of selfishness? Our amnes limited only to this body-mind complex. That this is me. For God, he's the creator of the entire universe. His amnes is pervading the entire universe. 
So the question of selfishness never arise there. Why we fight? Why there is hatred? Because of the sense of separation. If that sense of separation was not there, even if someone harms me, I cannot retaliate back. In Bhagavatam, a wonderful example has been given to understand this lack of non-violence in the one who is established in that real meaning of God. What's the way Bhagavatam is just explaining that? Again, with a very simple example. The Bhagavatam, it is mentioned while taking food. Accidentally, if your tongue is bitten by your teeth, you bite your tongue by your teeth, whom do you blame? You have been been extremely injured. If you find for a small child, for a small child, for the first time that's taking solid food and it happens, it bites its own tongue and it doesn't understand. Out of pain, it goes try to hit the mother. Isn't it? But actually, when they grow up, I know that actually uh, there is no one to be blamed. Whom to blame? So this is the real sense of unselfishness uh, which Swamiji is defining, uh, is using when he is u- defining the term God. Unselfishness is God. If we are established in that, then we there cannot be any hatred, violence, dissension. So based on that definition, now Swamiji ultimately comes to the idea of duty that and from the standpoint of such an universal definition of God duty in the words of Swami Vivekananda at last can be summarized as follows from a scriptures only he is quoting that paropakara panyaya papaya parapiranam that that's the idea that there is however only one idea of duty which has been universally accepted by all mankind of all ages and sects and countries. And that has been summed up in a Sanskrit aphorism. Do not injure any being. Not injuring any being is virtue. Injuring any being is sin. As simple as that. Now now we find as if we have defined duty. Yes, that duty is, should be based on that moral obligation. What's that moral obligation? I won't harm others. I will always, whatever my actions, whatever I feel is good for me, that I should do for others. Whatever I feel is unpleasant for me, I shouldn't do it for others. So that should be the sense of my duty. But now we find that, now the question is how to practice that unselfishness? And how can the spiritually oriented conscience which speaks of unselfishness, we tune to the authority and conscience. Means in our day-to-day life, I cannot simply deny the authority. The society in which I was born, the circumstances in which I was brought up, all the do's and don'ts which were taught to me, I simply cannot deny them and just say, no, that my spiritual oriented conscience is in not tuned with that and I deny that. Again, we will be creating a huge confusion in the society. So in this context, that how this authoritarian conscience and the spiritually oriented conscience can be synthesized in our in practicing unselfishness. That we have to be unselfish. And for that, that our spiritual oriented conscience, that's the thing, the voice of that spiritually oriented conscience I have to hear. But can that spiritually oriented conscience be in tune with the authority? Yes, it can be. And that has been described in the Bhagavad Gita. In the last chapter, we will find in the 18th chapter, the concept of Swabhava has been discussed in the Bhagavad Gita. And that's what Swami Vivekananda is bringing out, that how we can synthesize these two types of conscience in practicing unselfishness. And that's, let's read the words of Swamiji, the Bhagavad Gita frequently alludes to duties dependent upon birth and position in life. As per our birth, as per position in life, we as per our tendencies have been born in a particular situation. So we cannot simply deny that. It's my tendencies of my past birth has resulted in my birth in a particular circumstance. 
So and the, my sense of duty is bound to be dependent on my birth and position in life. Birth and position in life and in society largely determine the mental and moral attitude of individuals towards the various activities of life. It is therefore our duty to do that work which will exalt and ennoble us in accordance with the ideals and activities of the society in which we are born. So in this context, we are not bringing the exact sloka into the picture. We will find that Bhagavan is saying that as per our Swabhava, we are born in any of these four castes. There are only four castes. In Bhagavan, in Gita, he's mentioning there's Brahmana, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Sudra. In this world, there are no other caste, only these four caste. And God has created them. Why? So that the people, as per the Swabhava, can do their, can, uh, do their duty and progress in the spiritual path. Both can be combined. It's not that, that your secular life has to be segregated from your spiritual life. There is no watertight compartment between the secular and the spiritual. If we are, we know this concept of Swabhava, this spirit, that everything becomes spiritual. Nothing remains secular. In the words of Ramakrishna, our religion, as we don't have the proper sense of it, is just before the breakfast. After breakfast, I'm a different person. Now I'm a total secular being. Before breakfast in the morning, I took, I had my shower. I had some separate set of clothings. I wore that, I went to the shrine, offered flowers, offered incense, meditated. And then when I come out, have my breakfast, now I have to go for my work, I'm a totally different person. That's what religion is for most of us. It's just before the breakfast. Why? Because we couldn't implement that the idea of Swabhava, which has been spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita, in our day-to-day -day life. If we could have done, then the entire spirit, the, our life, instead of becoming compartmentalized into secular and spiritual, would have been spiritualized. We could have spiritualized our day-to-day -day life. And that's what is being spoken of here. That's why we are saying that all the entire world can be divided into this forecast. In, we just discussed, Brahmana doesn't mean someone who has been born as a child of a Brahmana. Brahmana means the intellectuals. We will find that certain that subsection of the human society, they like to dwell throughout their life in that intellectual level. They study, they enter the academic field, even they, after the completion of their studies, they continue as a professor or as a research scholar. And you'll find a considerable portion of the, our population are in that type of profession because of their liking. As they like it, they have gone to that type of profession. And then you will find that this, uh, these universities are there, uh, research uh, fellowships are there, that's the Brahmana. And then you will find the government, the state government, the national government, they're there to provide security, internal security, if there is some domestic violence, if, some, if there is some riot, for that also government is there in the, in the form of police to provide us the security. And of course, when there is international uh, conflicts, they are there. So they are the Kshatriyas, the Kshatriyas who are giving us that sense of security by protecting us from all sorts of violence and invasions. And the Vaishya, the business, we need not explain the entire world of this, uh, this, uh, this is national economy, whatever it depends on which their national economy depends, they are the Vaishya, all the business, all this, uh, the, uh, this multinational farms, everything speaks of the Vaishya. And the Shudra, the slave, doesn't speak of someone who is serving you personally. Even in the society, you will find that we need a particular section of the society to, society to keep the society in, uh, in a working condition. The road should be clean. There should be uh, proper sewage. There should be, uh, the park should be clean. Your uh, regular, this all the garbages has to be disposed properly. 
For that you will find the councils are there throughout the world. The councils are doing the work of serving the humanity. So the Shudras, we can say that to a certain extent, this, the councils, it doesn't speak actually of any hierarchy. It speaks of particular work as per my liking, as per my tendency. And when I can do that with a sense of duty and with a sense of service, it's not that, yes, all those work are there to sustain me, but I sustain myself uh, and I do, uh, just not with a sense of mercenary, that just to sustain myself, I'm doing that work. And that's why in this world, we find that there's working hours are fixed. And so very easily we can, we will find people are saying that as per the contract, this much was the work. I'm not supposed to do anything else. And that way we find that extreme selfishness is there even in the field of work. If we could have done with a sense of service, the same work, the same work would have become our worship. So duty is doing that work with a sense of service. As you may remember some in some uh, uh, few classes back, we gave an example, we give the example of Goodwin, the one who wrote the lectures of Swami Vivekananda, who took the shorthand notes of Swami Vivekananda's lecture. He was actually appointed for that. And in the process of taking the notes, he became his disciple. He was so influenced by these lectures, he became his disciple. And he came with Swami Vivekananda to India to serve him. And in short time, previously the people were impressed by the Goodwin service. Very dedicatedly to serve Swamiji. Even he used to take care of his personal needs. And then one day someone discovered that Swami Vivekananda actually remunerates him, gives him some monthly allowance. And immediately all started saying, oh, he is not a devotee, he is a paid worker. And this words at last came to the ears of Goodwin. And Goodwin's immediately the response was wonderful. He told, yes, it's true. It's true that Swamiji gives me some monthly allowance. He remunerates me. It's only because I have an old mother back there in England. I have, and she is there alone. I have came with Swamiji here and she had none is there to look after her, to sustain her. For her sustenance, I take, I do take something from Swamiji to send it to her so that she can be sustained. But no one should think that I serve, I serve Swamiji because of that. I really love Swamiji. It's my, my dedication. It's something which pours out of my heart. That's how I serve Hariji. So I serve Swami Vivekananda. So the idea is that we are placed in the society as per liking with particular duties. We should take it as an opportunity to serve. It's not with a sense of mercenary that you pay me in return, I give you this much of work. It's an opportunity. The society has given me an opportunity to serve. I've got that chance to do it. I like to pour my heart through that service. In return, I get something because after all I have to sustain myself, but I never equate it with that. So you will find this wonderful, the idea of Swabhava is something, it has far reaching implications. The same thing, the same work you can do with a sense without any self-respect. And again, you can do with a tremendous sense of self-respect. The moment you do with a sense of service, the same work becomes the cause of your self-respect. You start respecting yourself that yes, I am a productive member of the society and I am doing it with a sense of service. So, that's the idea which Swamiji is bringing here when he's speaking of this wonderful concept of Swabhava. But there are again challenges in practicing Karma Yoga as per our Swabhava. The first challenge is the lack of cognitive empathy. Now we use the word empathy, but this empathy can be, can be classified as affective empathy and cognitive effect, empathy. What's it? This Swami will, Swamiji is not using these terms, but in his discussion, you will find it is coming up. That when I say that I have to work, uh, that uh, we have to be empathetic. And many of us feel I'm empathetic. What's there in it? What's so, so big about it? But you will find my empathy is restricted only to my family, to my kith and kin. And there is no credit for that. 
That is not the real empathy that has came through evolution. Even in the animal kingdom, you will find that. What's that affective empathy is? That affective empathy refers to the sensations and feelings we get in response to others' emotions. It is like mirroring. This can include mirroring what the other person is feeling. Even in a small child, we find the children are playing together. One child falls and starts crying. All others starts crying. They just mirror. The mirror neurons are there to mirror. It is something which uh, has, as we evolved, we have actually imbibed those qualities. Uh, this mirroring of the other person's emotions. And we just feel stressed when we detect the other's fear and anxiety. It's not this. This affective empathy is not what Swamiji is speaking, speaking of. He's speaking of actually cognitive empathy. What is that? It is something unique to the humans. No one can do. In animals, you can have that affective empathy. You will see the lion after killing its prey is taking care of the small one of that prey. Uh, that suddenly that motherly love has started flowing. But there it is just an affective empathy. There is no such conscious decision behind it. The cognitive the empathy speaks of some conscious decision. It is called perspective taking. I have to imagine the pers I have to imagine from the perspective of the other person that what the other person is doing, why he is doing. Let me place him in his position and try to think of the situation. And then you will find that instead of being judgmental, you are, you are becoming sympathetic. To give a common example, it's a, uh, that a hardcore criminal was in the jail. The entire society uh, was constantly criticizing for that person for his crime. But when the interview was taken, what was revealed from that we all will find that we, instead of uh, simply reprimanding that person, criticizing that person, most probably we also will find we are becoming a bit sympathetic. What he told, that I was brought up in a situation, I was a refugee, in a refugee colony, we were all growing and this, everyone was very violent. When I was going to school, uh, on my birthday, I was went to school by wearing a wristwatch, which my father has bought me as a present, birthday gift. And some senior, seeing that wonderful watch, claimed, give it to me. When I denied, he told, if you don't give the watch, I will stab on your hand, stab on your wrist. And this child thought that he was joking. So again, he denied. And literally, he brought out a knife and was stabbed on the wrist. He was frantic. He, he was so scared. He started running frantically, ran from the school, went back to the home in expecting that the father would first apply some first aid bandage and allow the men to help him to stop the bleeding. And that's what he thought father ran, in a, uh, ran inside the house for when father just, uh, just heard that he was having stabbed by some other student on his hand. So he went inside uh, and this child thought most probably father has gone to bring some first aid. Instead of that, the father brought a knife, gave it to the child and told immediately go back and stab the one who has stabbed you. And after saying that, the criminal told, this is the environment in which I have grown up. So now you will feel, now you, can you say that you, now you place yourself in his situation? That isn't we who have been brought up in a family, very nice integrated family, isn't it all, but it's a blessing. As a child, I was helpless. If I was placed in that situation, I also would have grown with that type of mentality. So place, if, if you place in others position, then we will find that instead of judging, we also are becoming sympathetic. There cannot be any person whom, to whom we cannot be sympathetic. That's the perspective taking, you take his perspective. And that's the thing which is a human faculty, which no other animals can do. And Swamiji is actually speaking of that. How? He's not using the term. You will find he's mentioning an American think that whatever an American does is accordance with the custom of his country. Something which I have not mentioned here that Swamiji actually is indicating in this lecture. That in Chicago, where he used to go down the streets wearing his traditional uh, dress of a sannyasi, People has to humiliate him. 
Some will pull the turban. Some will just uh, give him a push. And that's, uh, that's what Swamiji faced again and again in the American society. Why? Because and then Swamiji is saying very nicely that most probably he is a very wonderful person. At home, he's a very affectionate father. But just seeing a person be different from uh, his own culture, immediately that affection has gone. So here he's speaking, that's why, that what we as a human being require is that cognitive empathy. Because when, because of that geographical, you know, that uh, now, that all the boundaries, have, all the geographical boundaries has boiled down. We all are now in a hodgepodge, in a cauldron with all the cultures intermingled. There we will find that what's happening as per my birth, as per my, uh, as per the way I have been brought up, my way of life apparently appears to be different from you. And if I try to practice my, what you say that swabhava, as my, as, if I try to do my duty as per my swabhava, some conflicts are bound to ensue. And there this practicing of the cognitive empathy is very important. Otherwise we can never, we can never in the present situation, can never effectively work as per our swabhava. We have to just simply uh, try to implement some regimented way of norm of life where my heart may not respond to it. That if everyone has been regimented that this is the only way that this is the only one coat size is available in the shop, everyone has to fit into it. You will find that the society will lose its heart. No one will feel like doing it. So Swabhava has to be given importance, but at the same time, we have to be empathetic and that empathetic should be cognitive. In the words of Swamiji and American things that whatever an American does is in accordance with the custom of his country is the best thing to do. And that whoever does not follow his custom must be a very wicked man. A Hindu thinks that his customs are the only right ones and are the best in the world. And that whosoever does not obey them must be the most wicked man living. This is quite a natural mistake, which all of us are apt to make, but it is very harmful. It is the cause of half of the uncharitableness found in the world. The sympathies. The sympathies of these men were limited within the range of their own language and their own fashion of dress. So the ill effects that ensue from the lack of cognitive empathy is much of the oppression of the powerful nations or weaker ones is caused by this prejudice. It dries up their fellow feeling for fellow men. So after saying that, Swamiji points out that the need for this to develop this cognitive empathy. Therefore, the one point we ought to remember is that we should always try to see the duty of others through their own eyes. That's the perspective taking. And never judge the customs of other peoples by our own standard. I am not the standard of the universe. I have to accommodate myself to the world and not the world to me. So after this, Swamiji is speaking of the second challenge in practicing karma yoga as per our swabhava. What is that? There is however another danger, this one great danger in human nature, namely that human never examines himself. So when I am supposed to do some work, I think I am up to it. To give a common example, a student is good in all the subject and also, of course he's good in uh, say biology and he gets chance in medical college or she gets chance in medical college. And as a student, he or she was post is performing very well. As long as he was, his knowledge was just restricted to the textbook, he found interest, it was quite well. And now when he has to go to the hospital, because after all, he or she is going to be the doctor and he finds or she finds the environment to be nauseating. Whenever he sees a sick person, sees blood, and now you will find that he has actually misjudged. Just love for the subject while reading the book doesn't enter that his or she is going to be a doctor because he or his or her temperament is such that they cannot face the situation when someone is sick. They also start feeling sick. That hospital environment sometimes repels him or her. 
So it's not the textbook anymore. And then he or she feels that this was not up to my swabhava. I have actually misjudged. And that's what happens with us. This, there is, however, one great danger in human nature. Namely, that man never examines himself. He thinks he's quite as fit to be on the throne as the king. Everyone thinks like that. So now how to overcome the second challenge? There is no other way than to learn from the experiences of life. That's a very hard way. When we begin to work earnestly in the world, nature gives us blows right and left and soon enables us to find out our position. No matter how long, uh, there's no matter, no man can long occupy satisfactorily a position for which he is not fit. There is no use in grumbling against nature's adjustment. He who does the lower work is not therefore a lower man. No man is to be judged by the mere nature of his duties, but all should be judged by the manner and the spirit in which they perform them. So your nature will de decide that. And we shouldn't think that such and, work, such and such work is greater and I should place myself there. And that's why we find that all the so-called dissatisfaction in our workplace is because of that that I have placed myself in some occupation which doesn't actually tune with my temperament. So the, when the hobby, hobby becomes our profession, then that profession becomes enjoyable. And that only through the experience we can learn. Otherwise, sometimes we, what we do, we that bite more than we can chew. And we find that we are almost incapable to deal with the challenges of that so-called responsibility. So once our swabhava is ascertained, we have to practice nishkama karma. Now this, now that heart should flow. That with my, that Swamiji used to speak of three H, uh, synthesis of three H, head, hand, heart. I have to be intelligent, that is, speaks of the head. I have to be skillful, that speaks of my hand. And at last the karma yoga comes when the heart also gets tuned to that head and hand. For most of us, that heart factor is not there. That even we find the doctor is quite skilled, is very intelligent, but at last, most probably is thinking of making money only. So then that can never turn into karma yoga. These three should come where my personal interest is not the prime factor. Service is the prime factor. So when, according to the swabhava, you have determined your duty, now with a sense of nimitta, as a sense of instrument in the hands of the Lord, you have to work. That's what Swamiji is saying, that then the nishkama karma, idea of nishkama karma has to fit in with your sohava. Later we shall find that even this idea of duty undergoes change and that the greatest work is done only when there is no selfish motive to prompt it. Yet it is work through the sense of duty that lead us to work without any idea of duty. When work will become worship, as in the sense, as in the case of Goodwin, which we are saying, that work became word, the worship, nay, something higher, then will work be done for its own sake. So, in the last class also we were quoting this sloka of Bhagavad Gita: Yatah prabritti bhutanang yena sarva midam tatam swakarmana. Whatever is your action, do it in a sense of service, abhyarcha, tamabhyarcha. That will give you Siddhi, that will give you emancipation. Siddhi Vindati Manava. So this actually entails the annihilation of your lower self, the ego, when you can do it in that way. That's what Swamiji is saying. The object being the attenuating of the lower self so that the real higher self may shine forth. The lessening of the frittering away of the energies of the lower plane of existence so that the soul may manifest itself on the higher ones. This is accomplished by the continuous denial of the lower desires, which duty rigorously requires. And what's the result? When with the help of your that swabhava, you can annihilate the ego and do your action without any sense of personal benefit, but do it with the help of service. The three things results with Swamiji, with which we'll conclude the lecture. There's a love, forbearance and chastity. The real love actually is what for us, 
at the present in the human society what love is that what gives me happiness that we love for my own happiness that we love to love that's the thing that's why by loving others that i find that the happiness is that is not love that is just simply infatuation that is lust in bhagavat this bhagavatam chaitanya in in chaitanya charitamrita chaitanya mahaprabhu is mentioning that atmarati kama that the so called love which is defined in the in the human society is not love there is no sense sense of self sacrifice so real love swami ji will define here the duty is seldom sweet it is only when love grises the real love grises its wheels then it runs smoothly he gives now example it is a continuous friction otherwise how else could parents do their duties to their children husbands to their wives and vice versa we previously never heard that uh, the to grow up the children is a big challenge it was considered a very natural duty now we, you, the statistics is something very very um, frightening most of a, a, a considerable amount of divorce happens after the child is born because they were not ready to be the parents that the sacrifice which is required there they are not ready to take the assertion is there that i want my enjoyment so how can love come even for growing up the children we find that the parents are parting off there a huge number of divorce happens after the birth of the child this but this when the real love is there that's why swami is saying how else could parents when the parent with the sense of love do it in spite of all the challenges they like it parents do their duties to their child husbands to their wives and vice versa do we not meet with cases of friction every day in our lives duty is sweet only through love where the other person's importance is more important not me that's that's the real love and love shines in freedom alone yet is it freedom to be a slave to the senses to anger to jealousies and a hundred other petty things that must occur every day in human life that's what is happening and that's the cause of all the dissension i give so much importance to me to my sense enjoyments that all from that the anger jealousy everything comes in all this little roughness that we meet in this life the highest expression of freedom is to forbear so the first sign that you love other is that love the second is forbearance when you can really love that you can really forbear that forbearance is bound to come in our life because of too much assertion of the self most of the time what happens we find the situation is uh, the present situation is something tormenting and we jump from the frying pan and go and fall in the oven itself and there are separations divorce and then we find that life has become hell most probably it was better with all the fight it was better it has become hell the jump from the frying pan to the oven itself most of the time people try to advertise they are quite happy but if you really don't try to fool yourself you see your own feelings you will find that the forbearance would have been something better and for that annihilation of the ego is the only thing we we can do that's why ramakrishna always used to say that he has his own grammar ramakrishna had his has his own grammar that in sanskrit you will find there are three sa that one sa is with a hissing sound one sa the tongue should touch the palate and in another the tongue should touch the teeth three types of sa are there and ramakrishna said you know the why there are three types three sa in his own way unique way he is to define sa sa sha j shoy she roy he is to make he is so ramakrishna was an expert in making is making pun with the words the one who forwears in sanskrit shoy means the one who in in hindi in in bengali shoy means the one who forwears j shoy she roy the one who forwears he sustains himself j na shoy the one who doesn't forbear tar nash hoy he destroys himself and that's why to give importance that emphasis to that forbearance which in sanskrit is sa that there are three sa in sanskrit what a unique way he is explaining so this is the forbearance this is the second thing chastity 
all these things actually speaks of the same thing that not my own assertion that as a human being we have the capacity to control our emotions with our will and that integrates us that the marriage is not only just for my own enjoyment it's actually through the children i am bringing up the next generation i am serving the society the next generation with the family and there again the le the less the ego asserts the better is a chance that you become a productive member of the society and this love forbearance chastity what else can the duty be defined as in a family if through the real sense of duty at last boils down whether through your life life love is finding expression forbearance is finding expression chastity is there that's the duty can any society deny that in the present society we find the councils are busy for this uh, having uh, what you say that uh, workshop on family violence why at last the duty bounds down to this three whatever may be the society however you may that you may say that i believe in freedom for us the freedom has become freedom of the senses but swami ji is saying the real freedom is freedom from the senses not freedom of the senses unless we know the real definition of freedom and at last every society has to come down to this and that's the thing which swami ji is saying is the ultimate proof of duty that the lack of the annihilation of ego finding expression as a love forbearance and chastity so with this actually ends this chapter uh, and the, the, then after that there is a story of the vyada gita which enumerates this that how by just doing your duty it will just take another 5 minutes i will just uh, uh, the story is very very interesting so that this chapter is concluded this day we can start with the next chapter the story goes this way that a sanyasi a young sanyasi was doing lot of austerity in the forest was meditating and one day while meditating he found a few dry leaves fell on his head and he looked up on the branches and saw one crow and one crane was uh, fighting and in the process the these dry twigs fell on his head and he got so ferocious so angry that some fire came out from his forehead and just cheered this burned alive those two birds they were cheered to death seeing that the sanyasi thought oh see how much power i have developed out of tapasya and with that same sense of that uh, pride now he went out went to the village for his begging he was standing in front of the door of a house uh, of a house and was asking uh, for arms and from the inner apartment a lady told oh sanyasi please wait and this sanyasi he was he became so hot he thought oh does this lady most probably doesn't know my power that what can i do and she is asking me to wait and immediately from inside that voice came the lady again told well oh monk it's not uh, just uh, the, 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 the your power of cheering burning to death the crow and crane i have some real responsible work to do so please wait don't be thinking so haughtily about your power now the son this monk was really surprised that how come this lady came to know about his power so after some time when she came this man this monk was so surprised asked the lady the lady told see i don't know any of this tapas my husband is sick that's my priority i serve him day out day in day out when you called for arms i was serving him so that's why i told please wait let me serve him and then i will come and uh, give you the arms offer you my arms and it is just by this service i have developed this powers just by nothing i do no tapas just by my service as a chaste wife i have developed this tapas and if you want to know more about this religion this religion of swabhava you better go i am i have practiced it but i am not a good exponent i cannot explain so for this exponent to, to if you want to have the explanation of it there is a vyadha in the marketplace a butcher is a butcher in the marketplace 
you go to him, he is a jnani. Now this sannyasi, when he went to that marketplace, to that butcher, he was horrified that he is just selling meat, sacrificing the animals, selling, how can he teach me about spirituality? He was about to go back when that man again told, have the lady send you? He was again really surprised how this man know. So now again, he thought, let me wait. There are so many things, so many things to surprise me today. Now, after this man did his job, along he took the sannyasi to his home and again to ask him to wait. He first went and tended on his aged parents, mother and father, took care of them, came. And then he told, see, as per my birth, this is my duty. I do it. And that also I do to sustain my parents, to take care of them. And with that, I have developed the spirituality. And then what he expo- what he expounds is in Mahabharata known as the Vyadha Gita. This is the background of the Vyadha Gita. So this is the story. Swami Vivekananda is uh, best, uh, expounding at the end of this lecture to just bring out this idea that you need not have to do something ec- apart from your uh, what has been entailed to you by your position in life. By doing that with a selfless manner, by just selfishly, with love, with forbearance, with a sense of chastity, you can know it for certain that that alone is sufficient to take you to the highest spiritual evolution. So with that, this lecture is concluded. So we stop our discussion uh, on this chapter. It's a very nice chapter, as you find. We will again continue with the next chapter from the next class onwards. So with this, we end our discussion. Thank you. Namaskar. Pranam Maharaj. Pranam Maharaj. Namaskar. Pranam Maharaj. Namaskar. Namaskar Swamiji. Namaskar. Thank you.